So welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today for the Tools and Technology Seminar Series. Um, if you have questions uh, at any point during the presentation, you can put them in the chat box. I'll be monitoring that and can let our speaker know if questions come up. Or if you prefer to ask them audibly, uh, you can use the Zoom reactions at the bottom right of your screen to raise your hand and I can always uh, call on you. We can ask you to unmute yourself at that time. So I'd like to uh, just quickly introduce our speaker. Today we have Nicole Sieberlich, who is an Associate Professor of Radiology and Biomedical Engineering, and is also co-director of the Michigan Institute for Technology and Translation. Great, um, thank you for the introduction. And um, you know, as Marcy said, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. So I think it's probably better if um, questions can be asked while I'm giving the talk instead of holding them all to the end, um, because there may be things that um, you want me to clarify. And um, you can also just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Um, so as Marcy said, um, I am an associate professor in the radiology department and also the co-director of the Michigan Institute for Imaging Technology and Translation. I moved to the University of Michigan almost three years ago, so almost completely in the pandemic, but not quite. And before that, I was um, an associate professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at um, Case Western Reserve University. So I'm kind of a, a biomedical person at heart. And um, my PhD is actually in physics. So even though I'm in the radiology department, I'm not a doctor at all, um, or not an MD type doctor, um, but I do work with a lot of doctors. And so, um, you know, while my research is focused on how to make MRI scanning faster and cheaper and better, um, we're going to take a much more holistic approach to MRI in, in this presentation, um, because I think this actually might um, suit you guys a little bit better. Okay, so first I want to start off by saying MRI is amazing. Like the fact that we can make images like this of the inside of the human body is, is totally incredible. Um, this technology is not really that old, so it's celebrating almost its 50th anniversary or birthday, I guess. Um, probably, I think next year is the official year that, that will be its 50th birthday. Um, and MRI has been used in a clinical setting for probably about 40 years. Um, and before we had technologies like this, if we wanted to know what was going on inside somebody's body, often they would do exploratory surgery where they just, you know, cut the person open and look around to see what is going on um, inside the person. And now we have this amazing technology, it's just one, but um, a pretty useful one that we can use to make diagnoses in a way that's much less intrusive than doing something like that. Um, okay, so as I mentioned before, um, while my research is all about how to make MRI better, I'm not going to talk about my research today. Um, instead, we're going to take a, a brief look at MRI um, and then see how MRI can be used clinically. Um, I want to go over some of the characteristics that we look for in our images, um, so kind of the, the constraints that we have when we are thinking about making images with MR. Um, then I will um, delve into how we make MRI images. So this is a little bit more of the physics. Um, we may go through this faster or slower, depending on how much time we have. And then I want to wrap up a little bit um, by talking about the various MRI scanners and groups that we have here at the University of Michigan so that you can better understand the landscape of, of MR here. Um, and I do want to mention right now this caveat that I'm going to be focusing mostly on human MRI. Um, so MRI used in radiology, um, the clinical uses of this technology. I'm not going to be talking much about small animal imaging, although we do have a lot of facilities here where the basic physics are the same, but of course the uses then are, are totally different um, for, for these different MRI scanners. Okay, so MRI um, is clearly an essential tool for us in radiology. So when you think about medical imaging, you probably think about x-rays, CTs, and MRI. Um, and each of these three different imaging modalities has totally different strengths, and they would be put to use in very different ways. Um, so you can see in this kind of you know, example x-ray image that what we see is mostly bones, and that's what we'll use x-rays for, bones, and um, often to look at the lungs as well. Um, CT allows us to see some of this soft tissue, so um, this is actually brain tissue, and um, we can use this sometimes to look at brain, brain bleeds and things like that, um, but it's very difficult to distinguish different kinds of soft tissue from one another, so for instance here it's hard to see the difference between white matter and gray matter in the brain, it's all just tissue kind of in CT, 
And this is where MRI comes in. Um, MRI allows us to depict different kinds of soft tissues very clearly. Um, so here you can see that there's a good delineation between gray matter and white matter. And also here, um, this is the, um, it's a ventricle in the brain where you can see the CSF. And um, it's due to this ability to distinguish multiple different types of tissues from one another that MRI um, is really uh, very important in, in clinical radiology. Um, so here's another set of examples. Again, here's the x-ray where we can see the bones, the CT where we can see bones here, but not really uh, distinguish that much else. And then in MRI, here's two different contrasts where we've collected our data in slightly different ways. So we can highlight different aspects of the tissue. Um, so we can see here the spinal cord, we can see um, some of the tissue in the discs here in between the vertebrae um, and some of the musculature of the spine in different ways, depending on how we collect our MRI image. Um, so as I mentioned before, in MRI, one of the main strengths is that we can change um, which tissues are bright and dark, depending on how we set up our scan. And I'm going to come back to this image um, a couple of times during the presentation so that you can see how some of these tissues are very different. So let's just take, an, as an example, um, the CSF here. This is the fluid in these ventricles. It's very dark in this image. It's very bright in this image. And it's kind of intermediate in this image here. Um, and CSF isn't normally something that we really need to highlight in our images, um, but it does serve the point that we can really change how this tissue will look in comparison to other tissues by playing with this contrast. We can also see different tracks here in the fibers um, in this image here, where we don't really see all that much in this image over here. Um, so this is great because it allows us to discriminate different types of tissues from one another. But what that usually means in an MRI scan is that we are going to be spending a lot of time collecting a lot of different images with different kinds of contrasts in different orientations, maybe looking, um, so this is an example here of a coronal slice so through the top of the body where we see the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, um, here's part of the spine. We can also make a cut directly through the body. So here we're seeing basically the body on its side, where again, we see this is some um, intestines up here, we can see the kidneys down here, here's the spine down here. Um, and all of these images, again, will be um, specifically designed to allow the radiologist to be able to separate different types of tissue, and to look for any structural abnormalities that might be going on in this person. Um, so when we talk about a typical MRI scan, so here's, here's one of our scanners that we have here at um, the University of Michigan, um, this will involve a couple of steps. Um, so the first thing we have to do is bring the patient in, we screen them for safety, um, because as we'll talk about in a little bit, this MRI scanner is a big giant magnet, and so we have to make sure that um, you know, when the patient goes into the magnetic field, they don't have any metal in their body, which will um, cause harm to the patient when they're getting their scan. Um, they change into a gown, so again, they don't have any metal on their clothes. Uh, we lie the patient down on this table and they zoom into the scanner. Um, and then the scan lasts a pretty long time, um, between 30 and 60 minutes usually, because we need to collect all of those different images with different contrasts and different orientations. Um, and that can take a long time depending on what we need to see in our images. So the MRI technologist is the one who is going to be running the scan. They're doing all of these different um, collection routines, we call them different sequences to get all those different images. We may administer a contrast agent. So this would go in intravenously, um, basically into your veins so that we can look at your blood vessels um, more clearly. And um, depending on the kind of scan, we may ask the patient to hold their breath while we're collecting the images because any motion while we're collecting the images can lead to errors in the images. So it can be a little bit annoying for the patient, depending on what kind of scan we're doing. And then after we're done with the whole scan, we send all the images to radiologists for them to evaluate them to sort of see what's going on with our patient. Okay, so what kinds of things would we be scanning for um, in MRI? Um, well, the most you know, obvious thing is that we're gonna look for any problems in anatomy. So if there's anything that's, that shouldn't be there in the wrong place, too small, for instance, that's what we'd wanna see in these images. Um, so again, this is an image of somebody's torso, basically like a cut directly through their head, um, like in this direction. And you can see that this is actually the skin of the patient. This black part here is fat that would be surrounding the patient. Depending on how we can collect our data, we can make the fat go away. So it's easier to see um, other parts, well, usually the water in, in the organs. Here you can see the liver again. Here's the stomach. We have the aorta coming down here. Um, 
we have here's some intestines you can see the hip bones down here um, and we're just looking for for any abnormalities anything that is structurally incorrect in these images um, we can do this in all different parts of the body so here's an example again of a brain image where we can clearly see the cerebellum looking really nice down here um, this is uh, the brain stem um, and of course their nose and their mouth and teeth and everything this is another example of a spine image um, and this is just a cute image that i think is kind of nice of a, a mom and the baby in, in the mri scanner okay so um, often what the radiologist will do is look at an image and they know after seeing tons and tons of these images what looks normal and what doesn't look normal so this is an example of a normal mri scan of the brain um, this is an example of a patient who has an enlarged ventricle. So you can clearly see, right, that there's something going on here. This ventricle is much larger than it should be. Um, and this is, you know, again, a stru structural abnormality that would be immediately obvious to a radiologist. Um, here's another couple of examples where even we can tell that there's probably something going on here that, that shouldn't be going on. Of course, usually these findings are more subtle than that, but this is, you know, an example of what could be seen with this technology. Uh, we can also, as I mentioned before, give contrast agents. We can see blood vessels really clearly. So the contrast will make these blood vessels very bright if we collect our signal correctly. So we can look to make sure that all the vessels are you know, intact, nothing's occluded. Um, you know, there's not something strange going on in with the development of these blood vessels. Um, this is an example of a patient with an arterial venous malformation. So it's like a big tangle of blood vessels here up in the brain. Um, and this would be something that, you know, radiologists would say, hey, we don't really want that there. Um, and what they might look for is actually the blood vessel that is feeding blood to this, this arterial venous malformation, AVM, um, in order to basically um, try to block this off so we could starve this AVM of its blood, and then they could eventually go in and, and take it out. So this is the kind of thing that they'd be looking for. Um, the other thing that MRI is really good at looking at is um, determining if there are tissues which shouldn't be there. So this is usually cancer is what we're talking about. Um, and again, the, the properties of the cancerous tissue um, are sufficiently different from the properties of healthy tissue that if we if we plan our MRI scan properly, we collect the data correctly, then it should be pretty easy to generate contrast between healthy brain tissue here and this glioblastoma, um, which you can see here. This is just another example of a glioblastoma um, that is basically coming into the ventricle um, of this person's brain. Um, this is um, an example again of cancer in, um, in the liver. This is a hepatocellular carcinoma, so HCC. You can actually see this little cancer here. Um, and depending on how the data are collected, we can either make it brighter or darker. And it's the combination of all of these different contrasts together that the radiologist will look at and say, okay, that's, that's definitely a cancer and, and not something else, not maybe something benign. These are just a couple of other images showing um, very similar um, examples. Um, Finally, we can look at, um, you know, we're not looking for completely different tissues, but we're looking to see if there's something that's off about the tissue that, um, that should be there, but, you know, maybe it's not functioning quite properly. Um, so here's an example of the heart. So this is the left ventricle of the heart. The right ventricle is over here, actually. All this white stuff is blood in here, and these little dark points are the papillary muscles. Here you can see the lungs up here, and then there's some liver and stuff down here. Um, and what's happening in these images is that this is just the normal cardiac tissue. It looks fine in this image, um, but some contrast agent was administered, and that contrast agent gets stuck anytime that there is um, scar tissue. And so the contrast agent, which is making the tissue bright, is actually right here. You can kind of see it a little bit. Um, but the problem is because um, of the way these images are collected, it's hard to generate a difference in signal from the blood, which is here, and this little scar tissue. But if we wait long enough, then that contrast agent, um, which was flowing through the blood and into the scar, it'll go out of the blood. So the blood becomes a little darker, but it'll get stuck in the area of the scar, which is pretty easy to see in these um, so-called delayed enhancement image. So, so it's not like cancer, it's not like tissue that you know is growing that shouldn't be there, but it's just indicating that something's wrong with this tissue. 
Um, this is another similar idea where this is a healthy liver where um, they're looking at this, this patch of signal in the liver and saying like, okay, it seems you know, pretty, pretty much like we would expect from healthy liver. Um, but when the liver becomes cirrhotic, so starts to uh, generate again, fibrosis, that it, the, the texture of the images becomes very different. And it's, it's fairly easy to see that this liver isn't working exactly like it should be. Um, and then there's a lot of work, especially here at the University of Michigan, to look at organ function with MRI. So this is not looking at the structure anymore, but to see like how well these different organs are, are actually um, doing what they should be doing. So fMRI, functional MRI, is, is kind of you know, something everyone's heard of, where um, the, the idea of functional MRI is that the, the subject is exposed to some sort of stimulus, so either something that they're looking at or something that they hear, and then um, with the MRI scan, we can see which parts of the brain are getting more blood, which parts are working harder. Um, so we take a simple, um, just a regular scan to look at the structure of the brain. And then usually overlaid on that are the areas which um, once we do our MRI scan look like they're activating a little bit more. And so we can basically say what parts of the brain are, are important in um, understanding whatever that stimulus is that they've gotten. Um, we do functional MRI for other organs as well. Um, so for instance, we can look at the function of the heart. Um, so this is a little bit hard to see here, um, but what you're seeing is the volume of the left ventricle as it's beating. Um, and so this the volume should get smaller and then bigger again. And you can use that um, in order to describe how well the heart is functioning, how much blood it can pump out with every beat it's doing. Um, and of course, can't get away without showing some movies. This is a lot of what I do. So basically what's happening in these images is that they've been collected um, pretty fast, one after another. And if we play them all in a row, then they just make a movie showing the heart beating. So um, this is again, how we'd figure out how well the heart is functioning. So here again, we see this is the, the heart wall, this, this um, kind of grayish part here. The white part is the blood. Um, this is the left ventricle, the right ventricle, and then the atria up here. You can actually see this valve here, uh, which is kind of flapping open <laughs> to keep the blood out and then let the blood in. Um, and these are just a whole bunch of vessels basically at the, the top of the heart that you can see, um, you know, as the blood is moving in and out of them. Um, this is kind of a cool example where we're not really looking at the function of an internal organ, but looking at um, speech, so how the mouth would move. This isn't necessarily something that a, a radiologist would look at, but maybe somebody who's doing speech therapy or trying to understand um, how the mouth is moving when we are making certain sounds. Um, An MRI can do that as well. And then I just have a couple of other cool movies that I thought were really interesting. So um, we haven't really talked about how MRI works yet, but it doesn't use any radiation. Um, so you might think of x-rays and CTs as scans that involve radiation. And so we don't want to give those scans unnecessarily. MRI, we also don't want to do unnecessarily, but because it doesn't involve any radiation, um, it doesn't pose a risk to, um, to anybody, whether you're an adult or a fetus. And um, so we can make images like this showing basically the motion of, <laughs> of a baby in utero. You can actually see the baby's kind of sucking his thumb at some point. Um, again, we may not make these on a routine basis, but, um, but they don't pose any harm to, to anybody getting a scan. Um, this is an example of um, somebody's brain. You're seeing their eyes move back and forth. And actually what I really like about this is just how much the optic nerve here, which is connecting the eye to the brain is moving around. Um, this is something you might not think about every day. Um, and this is not a human, it's an artichoke. And it's, it's a three-dimensional view through an artichoke, which yes, I know this is not made in our human scanners. It's just made in a small animal scanner. It's just really pretty and kind of shows the, the cool internal structures that we can see using techniques like MRI, which um, are difficult to see in other ways. Nicole, I have a quick question. Yeah. And you might cover this, but are the functional MRIs, is the machine the same equipment as the non-functional? It's just different software that's incorporated? Or? Exactly. Yep. So functional MRI and, and basically all of these Every scan, except for this artichoke, which maybe I should just back up from just so we can get rid of it. These are, are all made with the same types of MRI scanners. So um, they're all, 
um, we call them just human scanners. It's a 3T or 1.5T MRI scanner. And our research scanners and our clinical scanners are exactly the same, really. We just, we buy them from the manufacturer and use them for different things. Um, but they're really exactly the same hardware, you know, maybe with minor, minor modifications. So, you know, if you're doing an fMRI scan, the person can see out of the scanner, you know, to see whatever the visual stimulus is. But um, the only thing that's different is the software. And that's why the, the scanner console, like what we're actually doing at the scanner is so important and becomes very complicated very quickly, but, but exactly the, the same hardware. It's a great question. Okay, and perfect timing, because we're about to switch gears to when we analyze these images, what are we actually looking at? Um, so in my job um, and in you know a lot of um, human MRI, the end user of our scans is the radiologist, right? So when we, when we think about what they're looking at an image, that's the kind of thing that we look at when we're developing new techniques. So, you know, the most obvious is the size or volume of whatever, right? That is it, is it a normal size or volume question? Um, so in, in some scans, we can easily see, right? This is, this ventricle is too big. This is not normal. Um, so they might measure the size and that's the kind of information that they would report. Um, they might also look at the size of a tumor to say, this is, you know, this is how big it is um, based on you know, all these different images where with different contrasts where they can definitely tell it's a tumor. Um, and of course, we also look at the sizes and volumes of, you know, the, the ventricle here in the heart to see how much blood is being pumped out. And if it's something that they're trying to follow over time, they may use serial scans to say, did whatever we're measuring change? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Is it just different? Um, and this is, you know, again, a pretty straightforward measurement on an MRI scanner where it's, it's just looking at, you know, the size of something. Um, the other thing that we often look at is, is the tissue to, does it look right? <laughs> is it too bright or too dark? And, and MRI scans are really weird. I'm not going to get into this here um, in great detail, but you know, the actual, like if we would, you know, draw, oopsies, if we would draw a little circle in this patch of the image and try to measure the numbers in this image, those numbers themselves aren't a measurement of anything specific. Um, the, the actual signal intensity is a combination of a whole bunch of different factors. And so um, we can't just you know, draw a little patch and say, did this number get bigger or smaller over time? Because it's not a meaningful number. Um, and again, it's, it's complicated why we'll talk about that maybe in a little bit. But what we can say is that we expect myocardium to be homogeneous. Um, it should not change in signal intensity. And so when we see that there's a little patch here, that is too bright in this case, we say that there's something different about this tissue than about you know, the rest of this tissue. It's, it's, something's wrong. And the radiologists, they're, they're trained for years and years to be able to tell you if it's bright on this and dark on that and medium on this, then that means X, especially given the clinical characteristics of the patient. Um, so we use this too bright, too dark all the time, even though you know, I think when you actually think about it, that it's, it's a little funny that that's how MRI works. Um, I showed this image before where, um, you know, we looked at this patch of, of liver and compared it to this patch of liver to say, well, the signals here are different. And again, we aren't going to necessarily look at the numbers that we're measuring there, but, um, you know, here they're looking actually at the standard deviation over a patch of signal, which even that is probably a little questionable, but, um, you know, it's just looking at different qualities in the tissue to say, this is this is bright or dark or wrong, it shouldn't be here. Okay, so um, the last thing that we use a lot, again, when we're evaluating our images is does the radiologist like it? Um, and I know this sounds crazy, but uh, often what the radiologist is looking at is a very small portion of the image. And so anything that we would change in collecting those images might change the image in a way that it's no longer sufficient for the radiologist to use for the purpose that they would want to use it for. Um, so this is not something that's easy to, you know, look at a difference or a mean squared error, or, you know, it's very difficult to actually quantify, which is the bane of, you know, the existence of many MRI and, and other medical imaging researchers. Um, but what we often do is um, give our images to radiologists to have them rate them. And that's our best quantitative metric of our image quality, unfortunately. Um, so for instance, this is from a study that I've been doing where um, we have at the bottom, the old method. I collected these three images using an old technique. And then I collected, whoops, 
the top ones using a new method. Um, we collected all these basically at the same time. And we asked the radiologist to rate the old images versus the new images. And it's, it seems very disturbing, but this is the best quantitative, again, metric we have. Um, and we basically say, okay, the, the red bars are the ratings for the um, new images. The blue bars are the ratings for the old images. The higher the score, the better those images are. And if we you know, look at enough images and have them rated by a couple of cardiologists or radiologists, then we can tell whether we're actually getting a significant difference, improvement or, or lack of improvement in our new techniques. Um, so we look at all these, do a statistical analysis and say, okay, basically in everything except one reader or you know, the, the right ventricular wall, um, we had a statistically significant improvement in our image quality. Um, so this may feel a little unsatisfactory, but that's usually how we're, we're looking at our images. Okay, um, so I'm gonna kind of dovetail now into what an MR image actually is, right? I'm talking about these images, but like, what is that? Okay, so um, this is an MR image and it's really just a grid of, of pixels of numbers that we present in a you know, 2D matrix in order to make an image. Um, this may be obvious, but I just want to put it out there that if I kind of zoomed in here to see what was going on in my image, I would see, you know, a whole bunch of different numbers where we take the, the lower numbers here, we make those dark, and we take the higher numbers and we make those white, and the medium numbers are some sort of gray. And that's basically what we're looking at when I'm showing you this image. Um, so this is very different than like, you know, if you think about an x-ray where they would project it directly onto a film where it's, you know, basically like, an analog picture. So MRI is not that, it's, it's all digital. Um, and, and that's what you're actually seeing is what I'm representing in this image. Um, unfortunately, um, we can't just, you know, put our object or our patient into the scanner and immediately capture this image um, because MRI is a little bit more complicated than that. And we have to do this detour through the space where we actually collect our data. Um, so we're collecting our data in the space called K-space. So this is what actually happens when we're sitting at the MRI console, we're directing the scanner to collect this data. And once we have this data, we do a mathematical transformation on this data, it's called the Fourier transform, which gets us to this image. Um, so it's not important to really understand where that's coming from, but the fact that we work in this other space is actually has a, a lot of implications on the, the image that we get out. Okay, so what do we care about in these images? So when we're thinking about how to make them, we usually care about the resolution, the contrast between different tissues, the signal to noise ratio, um, the total time it takes to make the scan, and then artifacts. So we'll look at each one of these individually. Okay, so here's my image, right? It's just a matrix full of numbers. And um, I have a couple of different, um, there's a couple of different values that we use to talk about this matrix of numbers that makes up the image. Um, so the first is what's called the field of view. That's basically how big this area is that we need to scan. So for the brain, it might fit into a field of view of like 250 millimeters by say 250 millimeters. These values don't have to be the same, but often they are just because it makes it easier. If we're talking about the abdomen, it might be a larger field of view. It's a larger area we have to cover. Um, and unfortunately, because of the way MRI works, everything, that is in this plane that we're trying to make an image of has to fit into the field of view. We can't just zoom in to like a small little area in here. Um, it doesn't work like that, basically. Um, we need to have everything in that, in this kind of box. All the, the signal has to be coming from there. Um, we also have then how big of an area each of these individual numbers represents. Um, so this is actually the resolution. And the resolution of our scans are typically between one millimeter and two millimeters. So you can imagine like, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of tissue that would fit in like a cube that's one millimeter by one millimeter by one millimeter. But all of that gets kind of compressed down into one number, which represents whatever is going on in that pixel or that, that voxel is what we call that, that three-dimensional space that's kind of being all squished together to, to be represented as a single number in MRI. Um, and then also important for us is how many numbers we need across this whole area. Um, and that, so for instance, in the X direction is going to be the size of the field of view in this direction divided by 
you know, how big each of these individual boxes are. So if the field of view is 250 millimeters and each of these little boxes represents one millimeter, that's basically the size of the tissue that we're gonna represent in there, then we're gonna need 250 numbers across this direction to represent the entire field of view. And again, we do the same thing in the Y direction and none of these numbers has to be the same. They can all be totally different um, because they're just two orthogonal different directions which we can totally treat as independent. Um, so this is our, our resolution and field of view portion. Um, so this is an example of a knee scan with a poor resolution that um, basically the, the amount of tissue we're trying to represent as one number is just too much. And when we do that, we can't see fine edges and details and the radiologist would probably come back and say, this is not a very good image because the resolution is too low. Um, what they want is an image that looks like this where the resolution is much higher. We can see those, those edges, um, it's a lot crisper. Um, and there's reasons that we would try to push the radiologist more towards an image that looks like this because it's much faster to collect, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, this image takes a lot more time but has a lot more potential information that could be used for a diagnosis. So there's always a trade-off between these guys. Um, the other thing that radiologists are really very concerned about, and rightfully so, is this contrast. But they want to be able to um, make sure that there's going to be a distinction between different types of tissues, especially tissues that they want to um, be able to discriminate from one another. Um, so for instance, you know, if there was a tumor hiding in here, but in these three images, the tumor had exactly the same signal intensities as the healthy tissue surrounding it, we wouldn't be able to see it, right? And that would kind of ruin the whole point of the MRI exam. And so depending on what they're looking for, they will set up the scan um, to have different contrasts so that they can look for those, those different, um, you know, different abnormalities that they may be um, wanting to rule out in these images. So as an example, um, this is, it's not a beautiful image, but here's the liver um, and there's a tumor in here and it is a little bit darker than the surrounding tissue, but I would say that the scan parameters haven't really been optimized to be able to separate this tumor from the rest of this tissue. Um, so this might not be the best set of settings for, for this um, particular um, deployment of, of MRI. Whereas here, you can clearly see there's something different here, right? And the radiologist will know again that, you know, if it's bright on one and dark on another, then that means it's this type of tissue. And this again is an HCC, where you can, again, clearly distinguish it based on the difference in contrast between these two images. Um, so this, along with resolution, is really, really important. Uh, radiologists also care about the signal to noise ratio. So let me just get to some of these images. So basically the signal is, is actual true signal arising from um, water molecules in, in the part of the body we're trying to look at. Noise can come from a whole bunch of different places, but the, the noisier the image, the lower the SNR, the more it will look like this. And what a radiologist wants is a high SNR image. Um, and this also sometimes can take a lot of time to get an image where we have the right contrast, a high resolution, and, um, and enough signal to have an image that's like this and not like this. Okay, so um, the thing that I have been talking about telling you about, but I haven't told you about yet. So, so here's our image. Um, you know, it has a certain uh, field of view, a certain resolution. And it's related to the MRI data, which is over on the right-hand side, through the Fourier transform, the 2D Fourier transform, or the, it's the discrete Fourier transform, which is why it says DFT. Um, and so this is the space that the MRI scanner is actually collecting. And once it has it all, then it can convert it into this image. And the way that we usually collect data in MRI is um, you know, we, we need to collect for every number we have over here. So for every you know, nx times ny number, we need to collect one number in our two-dimensional case-based data. Um, and often we collect these numbers not one at a time, but we can collect them efficiently a line at a time. So we'll collect one line, and then we have to often wait for the magnetization to do what we want it to do to make this image. Then we collect another line and so on and so forth until we've collected all of the lines of our data space, then we can convert it back into this image. So if we look at how long it takes us to collect this data, again, um, we need to collect NY number of lines. That's how many, one, two, three, how many lines we have 
in this direction times the amount of time it takes us to collect one line. Um, and this time will depend on the contrast that we want in our image, what we want bright, what we want dark. Um, and we call it the TR. So I think I have yes, a replacement here where it takes us TR to collect one of these lines here. Um, so the number of line, or the number of lines times the time to collect each line is the total acquisition time we have for, for this data set. Um, and as I mentioned before, all of these things kind of come together in MRI to form like this horrible triangle of doom where we can scan really fast, but we'll have to have a low resolution or very low signal or both. We can try to get to a very high resolution scan, but this takes us a long time and we will lose signal um, because each of our little, little voxels full of um, magnetization will be very small. And we can try to get a high SNR, but to do that takes a very long time and we would typically go to a lower resolution. And so it's always a matter of trying to find the space on this triangle, which is appropriate for the, um, the indication that the patient is, is coming in for, for the scan. And that may depend, um, you know, if it really um, is a factor of what the radiologist needs to see in those individual images. And the thing that, um, we also have to keep in mind, which can be really tricky, is this idea of artifacts. Um, so this is kind of off that triangle of doom because these artifacts can come from all sorts of, of different sources. So an artifact is anything that appears in our image that isn't actually in the object. So for instance, this is somebody's brain here. You can see their eyes up here. This is actually their nose. Um, and all of this stuff, which is on the outside of the head, that isn't really there, right? It's not actually in you know, it's not surrounding the patient, a signal that's coming from somewhere else that shouldn't be there. Um, that's, you know, a function of how we collected our data or how we process the data. And what's actually happening in this particular scan is that the patient is moving their eyes. And this motion that's happening while we're collecting our data, um, because of this strange transform we have to do to get from our data space to our image, is causing these weird kind of fluffy looking artifacts. <laughs> um, and Often a radiologist can look at that and say, you know what, I'm not interested actually in anything up here. I'm interested in what's going on in the brain, so I'm not going to let this bother me. Uh, but sometimes these artifacts can be more disruptive and they could even mimic pathology if we're not careful. Um, here's an example of a, a brain scan. So again, here's the, the brain, here's the, the neck down here. And this is where the person's mouth should be. Um, but they're wearing braces and braces are metal. And... Um, MRI works with a big magnet and the metal combines with the magnetic field of the magnet in order to basically make it impossible to do any scans um, in that part of the, of the um, anatomy. So you can see here, and I see my little picture, but maybe you can see under me. There we go. Um, this is, again, this kind of hole in where the front of the brain is, and that is it's just disruption of the magnetic field due to, due to the braces here. Um, here's what happens if we try to make our field of view smaller than the object. So you can see that, um, you know, I said, oh, I'm not going to worry about this part of the brain that's on the outside because I don't really care about that. It actually starts to appear on the other side. Everything has to kind of squeeze into the field of view. And that causes problems not only at the edges, but it can also cause some issues in other places in the image, again, because of this weird relationship between the data space and the image. Um, and this, for some of our scans, is the biggest problem of all. So um, here's the back of the patient, and here's basically their tummy. And this is the liver here, which is obscured by all of these, these rings of things. You can see there's something going on up here. What's happening in these scans is that the patient started to breathe while we were collecting data. And you can imagine that you know, the image doesn't, doesn't look like this the entire time when they're breathing. You know, sometimes when we're collecting our data, they're, um, you know, their belly has puffed up and sometimes they might be you know, letting their air out. So it might be smaller. Um, and it's, it doesn't result in just a blurry image. It actually results in you know, these strange sort of effects all throughout the image again, because of this weird relationship between how we collect the data and have to convert that into an image. So it can be a little unexpected um, occasionally <laughs> to see what the, the results on these, these images can be. Um, so not only do we have to worry about 
the, the time of the imaging, the contrast in the image, how much signal we have in the image, but we also have to try to avoid um, artifacts like this. And in some cases we could say, please try to keep your eyes still or put the artifacts somewhere where the radiologist doesn't care. Sometimes, you know, there's not a lot we can do if they have braces like this, most braces and things like that aren't, aren't a problem anymore. Um, they don't cause these big artifacts. Um, we have to make sure that we include the entire object in what we're scanning. And then, um, you know, down here, we have to squeeze, this is another acquisition time problem. We have to squeeze our whole acquisition into the amount of time that the subject can hold their breath. Okay, so um, in the interest of not keeping you for a very long time, I'm not going to get into this now. I'm happy to come back and talk to you about how we collect MR images if you ever want to hear that. But I am going to zoom down to MRI here at the University of Michigan, um, because we are the people you can contact if you ever have any questions about MR. So um, we have at least 20 human MRI scanners. These are housed in all sorts of different departments, um, but many in the Department of Radiology. And um, you might hear a 1.5 Tesla or three Tesla MRI scanners. These are very common um, clinical um, MRI scanners that we would have floating around. Uh, we are also one of the very first groups to get an FDA approved low field system. This is a 0 0.55 Tesla, so a lower magnetic field system. And that's this guy right here, um, which again, looks like any normal clinical system, um, but we are lucky enough to be able to use it for, for research. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, there are many other animal scanners that um, we have access to. So these are often much higher field strengths, but here you can fit a person and here you can only fit some small animal. So it, these are not suitable for human scanning. Um, but if you're not interested in scanning humans, there's a ton of these out there. Um, and these are in all sorts of different departments um, at Michigan Medicine, so radiology, radiation oncology, there's some in, in surgery, um, and then in departments of engineering as well, like biomedical engineering. Um, they have a couple of scanners over there. Um, so there are also several groups who do research and have research MRI scanners. So these are scanners which, you know, People who want to do research projects on them can call us up and we can all work together to figure out how to make those research projects possible. Um, so two of our scanners are um, with me at the Michigan Institute of Imaging Technology and Translation. Um, so I co-direct that with um, Dr. Gulani in radiology. And we have a 1.5 Tesla system and a 0.55T system for development and application of new MRI techniques. There's also the 3T lab, which is run by Tom Chenevier, also in the radiology department. And he has a three Tesla MRI system, um, which is used also for development and then more translational work. So um, he does a lot of like clinical trial scanning and, and he has a really wonderful system for that. And then in biomedical engineering, Doug Knoll and his team have the functional MRI laboratory. They do a lot of this fMRI scanning where they're looking for different activations in the brain. Um, and he has, I think, two 3T MRI systems. He may, maybe just one, but I'm pretty sure it's two of them. Um, and these groups are, are independent, but all work very closely together. Um, so, you know, if you contact one of us and we think you would be better suited to work with another, there's, you know, no competition. We're all, we're all a happy MRI family here at the University of Michigan. Um, and so I just wanted to, you know, touch very, very briefly on one slide on some of the, the research that's happening here. Um, so we, we like to use MRI in all sorts of new applications. So this is working really closely with, um, with our clinical partners to find new ways of helping patients with MRI. So looking at patients with cardiac arrhythmias or using fMRI to help surgeons avoid like important parts of the brain that they may not want to touch when they're going in to do surgical planning. Um, we also are working on improving existing MRI techniques. Um, so, you know, in, in radiology, Tom Chenevere is looking at making consistent measurements of tissue diffusion on all different kinds of scanners. Um, my group is working on using our low field system for clinical imaging. So this is you know, basically trying to figure out how we can make these scanners immediately better for clinical usage. Um, and then um, a lot of us do kind of way more out there things like trying to figure out new ways of collecting or processing MRI data. So we crack open the, hit, the hood of our MRI scanner and say, we wanna do things totally different, not at all like it's been programmed to do before. Um, and that allows us to do really cool things like map tissue properties or to um, develop new machine learning techniques to um, 
use less data to make images faster and better and with higher SNR and everything. So um, all of this is going on here. We range really from basic MRI research all the way to, to clinical areas as well. Okay, so um, I hope that that was what you guys were looking for. And um, I wanna thank you for, um, for coming and, and joining. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. I also put my email address um, here in case you want to contact me. And then you can check out the website of the Michigan Institute for Imaging Technology and Translation that is down at the bottom. So with that, I will I'll wrap up and I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you, Nicole. I really appreciate that presentation. It was very interesting. Um, so yeah, if anyone has any questions, you can put them in the chat box or simply unmute yourself and uh, we can give it a couple minutes, see if anyone has any questions. I don't bite. Well, we're waiting to see if anyone else uh, has anything. I was wondering if you could actually say a couple more words about the, the machine learning efforts to remove artifacts or various aspects from the images. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, basically, everyone's using machine learning to do everything right now. So um, I'm just gonna zoom back to can somehow it's not lagging me okay um so going back to the slide about the data which is right here um so one um, of the tricks that we like to use to make our scans faster is just not collect oops, all of these lines of data we were like it takes too long so we're just going to skip some of these and if we do that, then we end up with artifacts in our image. They, they don't look good, and the radiologists don't want to use them. Um, but we have all sorts of additional sources of information that we could plug into like an intelligent sort of imaging reconstruction algorithm, like machine learning, um, like um, information about prior scans that the patient may have gotten, or scans in different modalities, or features that we know our image should have that we would like the reconstructed image to retain, even though we didn't actually collect enough data to reconstruct the whole image. And so we, um, we and everybody else, you know, in the MRI world have been working on training machine learning algorithms to, um, you know, take in data that's not quite enough to make an image. But, you know, if we have a network that's been trained to be able to extract the important parts of the image from that not enough data, you can output an image that's just as good as if we had collected all of the data. Um, it's a little tricky to train networks like that because you don't want, the concern is always if you train a network on you know, images that don't have tumors and then you show it images with tumors, is it going to output an image without a tumor because it hasn't seen that before? And so there's all sorts of testing that, that goes on there. Um, but I think that, you know, this is where machine learning is very powerful. It's just a matter of figuring out how to teach it the right things and ask it to do things that it's been trained to do. Great, thank you. Uh, again, if anyone else has questions, you can feel free to just unmute yourself or just put them in the chat box. And we'll just give it just a minute. We're right at about 10 till, so we'll wrap up shortly if there are no questions. <laughs> 